For those of you who are watching online this morning, the title of my sermon is Do Not Judge Others. We have a very interesting scripture reading this morning from the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Mark. Jesus returns to his hometown of Nazareth and is rejected. So let's get started this morning by hearing these words from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all of this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their own hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Beloved, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. This is the first time in Mark's gospel that Jesus has entered his hometown synagogue. Jesus left Capernaum and went to Nazareth. His successful activity, activities in neighboring synagogues like Capernaum would lead us to believe and to expect positive results here as well. Immediately preceding our scripture reading this morning, we find a woman who had been suffering from a bleeding for 12 years and was healed simply by touching Jesus' cloak. And in that same story, we have Jesus healing a dead girl. She was the daughter of Jairus, the synagogue leader. For those of you who are in our Thursday morning Bible study, you will recognize those two stories from the last episode of The Chosen that we watched. One might expect that these stories would have quickly spread throughout that region and especially to his own hometown, which is where he had just entered. News of Jesus' healing always spread quickly throughout the region where he was, which is why there was always a crowd there welcoming him, bringing their sick on mats for healing. In verse 2, it says, on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all of this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? So we do find that the people of Jesus' own hometown have heard of his wisdom and his healing. But the scripture says they were astounded. The dictionary defines astounded as shocked or great surprise. And the people, they start questioning one another. Where did this man get all of this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Why are there all of these questions here in Nazareth? Why do these people from Jesus' own hometown, people he grew up around, why do they not believe in him? Let's go to the next verse to find out why. Verse 3 says, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. So now we start to be enlightened a little, but we also need to bring in a little history here to bring things in to context. Whenever we read in scripture that and someone is being introduced, it usually says so-and-so, the son of so-and-so. So let's go back to chapter one of Mark's gospel when Jesus calls his first disciples. 
Verse 19 says, And he went a little further, and he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending their nets. James, son of Zebedee. But in our story, it says the son of Mary. Not the son of Joseph, but the son of Mary. This is an unusual designation and ignores all reference to a father figure. This would be a direct insult on Jesus' character and his honor. In the first century, it would have been hinting at who was someone who was illegitimately conceived. This type of history with a fatherless lineage would be scandalous to everyone. Also note that the scripture lists all of Jesus' brothers and that his sisters were there with the people in his own hometown. Ancient Christian tradition specifies that Joseph died when Jesus was very young. And that tradition also asserts that G Joseph had a first wife before his marrying Mary, meaning that Jesus had half-brothers and sisters with him being the youngest. Of all of the brothers mentioned in Scripture, two are worthy of exploring a little more. There is the mention of James, who was the oldest, and Judas. The book of James was written by James himself, and he identifies himself in the first verse of that book. It is widely accepted by the scholars that the book of James was written by Jesus' half-brother James. Keeping in mind that the New Testament was written in Greek, the Hebrew name for Judas is Jude. The book of Jude was written by Jude himself, and he identifies himself as the brother of James. And scholars also widely accept that this Jude was a half-brother of Jesus as well. But worse than the insult of questioning Jesus' lineage is that the first part of that sentence says, is not this the carpenter? Jesus' status as a local craftsman would have been considerably lower than that a member of an educated class, a person who could devote themselves to studying the law. In the social system in the first century, status was understood as fixed. Your status at birth defined who you would always be. And the honor-shame considerations were also important in this culture. The hometown crowd simply regarded as impossible for Jesus to amount to anything else other than a carpenter. The people of Nazareth indicate this negative perception when they identify Jesus as just a carpenter. Can you imagine what kind of impact that type of thinking would have in our society today. Look at me. I'm just a simple old country boy who grew up on a farm. Should my status be defined as that of a simple country boy who could amount to nothing more? Is it not God who gives us the various gifts through the work of the Holy Spirit? Is it not God who transforms us and empowers us through the work of his Holy Spirit? Is it not God who is in control of everything? Remember, nothing is impossible for God. Now let's look at King David. God took him from being a shepherd and made him king of Israel. And the people of Jesus' time knew this. So how could they say that Jesus is just a carpenter? When Jesus visits, Nazareth is the place that he grew up, but not the place where he was born. 
It is highly likely impossible that the people of that time did not know and were not aware of his virgin birth and that Mary was the Virgin Mary, Virgin Mother of the Messiah. So the people, thinking they know who Jesus is, because he grew up there and worked there, they take offense at him. All of this brings us to the point of not judging other people. This story reminds me of the scripture on judgment in Matthew and in Luke. Interestingly enough, Mark has nothing about judgment in his gospel. Matthew chapter 7 says, Do not judge others so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make will be the judgment you get. And the measure you give will be the measure you get. In Luke chapter 6 it says, Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. We live in a broken and sinful world. It is way too easy for us to get caught up in judging others. I sometimes myself struggle with that. When I find myself starting to judge someone, I have to remind myself of the scripture and then turn my thoughts to prayer. Asking Jesus, help me to not judge others. A long time ago, I found myself standing in line behind someone at the cash register at the grocery store. The person in front of me was being rude and very hateful with the cashier. I found myself starting to judge that person, and I moved, tried, tried, and tried to move my thoughts away from that. But the situation was becoming more toxic, and I found myself doing the very thing I did not want to do, which was to judge that person. But the Holy Spirit was working in that entire situation. Because before the person left, they apologized to the cashier for their behavior and explained all of the hardships that had befallen on them recently and then apologized once more before they left. The Holy Spirit was also working in me as well because I learned a very important lesson that day. Do not judge others because you have no idea what another person is going through. I'm sure you've all heard the saying, do not judge others until you walk the mile in their shoes. Let's all try to remember that because truly we have no idea what another person is going through. And it is not up to us to judge that person anyway. Also, do not judge someone based on your preconceived notions of their wisdom or knowledge. God works in each and every one of us in wonderful and mysterious ways. He opens our hearts and minds to his holy word and fills us with wisdom through his spirit. And as we continue to grow spiritually, we grow in the knowledge of God. Judgment is what happened at Nazareth. The people thought that Jesus was just a carpenter, but he was Emmanuel, God with us. When I read this text about judgment and think about what Jesus went through, I'm reminded of the scripture from Hebrews chapter 4, which says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet is without sin. Jesus knew disappointment. He knew what it was like to be rejected and disparaged by the people who knew him. Jesus can understand what we are going through. So pour out your heart to Jesus in prayer when you are 
going through rough times. Back to our scripture now. Despite his hometown's assessment of him, Jesus provided an alternative self-designation. Prophet. Verse 4 says, Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their own hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. Even Jesus' half-brothers and sisters did not truly believe him, who he was, until after his death and resurrection. And by referring to himself as prophet, Jesus associated himself with a long line of cultural figures in Israel, such as Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. In the Gospels, also, others would also view him this way, but not in Nazareth. In an honor-shame society, prophets would have been received with honor. But the traditional wisdom of that age was that this generally occurred in places where prophets were less familiar, hence Jesus' own words. Prophets are not without honor, except in their own hometown, among their own kin, and in their own house. To be recognized as a prophet in one's hometown meant that the honor due to other persons and families would have been diminished. A claim to be more than one's appointed share of honor threatened others and would eventually trigger attempts to cut the claimant down to size. This was the issue at stake in Nazareth. Turning to verse 5, it says, And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. So we have to ask ourselves, why could Jesus do no deed of power there? He is God incarnate. He could perform any miracle he wanted. A miracle is not just an event, but also an interpreted event. If Jesus is not regarded as being capable of healing in the minds of the people, any healing that does happen would not be attributed to him. He knew the people would reject whatever evidence that he would give them, and therefore to give them more evidence would have only increased their damnation. So Jesus heals only a few sick people there. Perhaps Jesus recognized their willingness an ability to believe in him and thus he gave them something truly remarkable to believe in the last verse of our scripture says and he was amazed at their unbelief the lack of faith in these people amazes even Jesus Jesus is no stranger to people's unbelief, especially from his own countrymen. We read story after story in the Gospels about people who did not believe in Jesus. And this is especially true for the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the scribes, and the Sadducees. I want to wrap this up with these brief thoughts. Romans chapter 14 says, Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 it says, For all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ." so that each may receive due recompense for what is done in the body, whether good or evil. Judgment belongs to God, 
And Jesus is God. If you ever find yourself in a situation where you might be tempted to judge someone, pray for them instead. Remember, you have no idea what another person is going through. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Please turn to page 12 in your hymnal for our communion liturgy.